There won't be a session. Papino is quite to sit. The date of the session must be decided today. You realize what that means, Finlay? You are the governor, my lord. You are the governor. John? Papino. <laughs> January 1835. A brooding tension hung over the city as palpable as the winter storm. Between English conquerors and French conquered, there was increasing hostility and scarcely veiled acts of defiance. Quebec's parliamentary representatives, inspired by their speaker, Louis-Joseph Papineau, embarked on a strategy which threatened to disrupt Parliament and ruin the English merchants, whose tottering trade position required governmental action. Thus, in the heart of the blizzard, a storm of a different kind was brewing. Here's a letter from Lord Elmer. Bourdage. Leaving me outside to freeze, aren't you ashamed? <laughs> Monsieur Papineau doesn't think uh, that a reply is necessary. You understand? Pardon? There's no reply. Get out. There's Monsieur Papineau at home. He's in no mood to see anyone. He's hardly had a bite to eat. Monsieur Lafontaine first, then a high and mighty gentleman from Montreal. Rodier. Rodier. But they didn't get very far. They didn't even reach the staircase. Perhaps you, the oldest parliamentarian. But what's the difference? He has a respect for you he never had for the others. And you're from Montreal. Oh, no, from Richelieu. Well, in any case, you don't come from Quebec. A good thing, too. If you were from Quebec, you wouldn't stand a chance. Back and forth. Back and forth. It's been like that ever since this morning. He's living on his nerves. Well, I'll be going, Madame Larue. Shall I tell him you'll be coming back? Don't bother. As things stand at present, then there won't be a session. Right. Because of him? Yes. Tell me, is he right? He'd be a clever man indeed who could say he's right or wrong. Please, please, Mr. Finlay. The Speaker of the House, and he refuses to sit. He's defying you. He doesn't even condescend to consider your injunction. Papineau in jail. That would start a riot. Well, go ahead. And how many soldiers have I available? Call up civilians. Commandeer all the shotguns. I have orders not to resort to force except in emergency. <laughs> it's paralyzed the whole trade, the banks, all the construction of ships. And now you're going to allow him to paralyze the government? You will act when it's too late, when he's destroyed everything. Do something. There's only one person who has sufficient influence to get us out of this deadlock. Elze Abedar. Unemployment is rife. Cholera is spreading and Monsieur Papineau just thinks. Last year, on a similar occasion... He I... also refused to sit. He sulked. Not yet. Louis-Joseph Papineau sulked. If you had the slightest respect for someone who is really... A demigod? You treat him just as though he were a demigod. But your husband has disagreed with him. So have I. Today? Uh, perhaps he's right to try to paralyze Parliament. Monsieur Bourdain. Supposing he is right. Supposing Parliament doesn't sit. Your husband and I, all of us, will just have to barricade ourselves at home and stay put. Ah, inertia. And in Parliament, too. The House votes on a resolution. The Council rejects it. Sitting for nothing might as well not sit. And the poverty? And who's the cause of poverty? The company of merchants. 
Aren't you oversimplifying things? And who controls our commerce? The shipyards? The administration? The English, I suppose. A flock of vultures. Monsieur Bourdage. Your father is one of them, madame. I haven't forgotten. He's an English merchant, indeed. I have a lot of respect for you, madame. But for James Lampierre Marret, I'm sorry. I shall try and forget my origin. My grandfather was turned out of Acadia. By whom? My father, twice from the Betty Chaleur. By whom? But we're talking of Louis-Joseph Papineau. In this matter, the sentiments of Monsieur Papineau and myself are the same. You honor him. Blindness won't lead us anywhere. As for me, it's all quite clear. Cholera is spreading. Is that the fault of the merchants? If the ships that brought it had sailed straight past Grosil, if they hadn't anchored and unloaded there, there'd be no cholera. All the same, you mustn't blame the merchants for all the country's ills. Their profit. They can only see as far as their profit. According to you, they're all criminals. It's open piracy. Oh, come It's come quite now. true. And you're going to put all these things right by not sitting? Well, it's rather a bold move. You think so? If the house doesn't sit, Aylmer's back is against the wall. Either he doesn't touch the subsidies and poverty will increase beyond all reason and he'll capitulate with an appeal to the commons in England. Or he'll seize the subsidies. Papino only has to say the word and Lower Canada will explode. And that means? Out with the rifles. Shooting. That's madness. We'll see. Personally, I am against any solution that must almost inevitably lead to the shedding of blood. Tell me, Monsieur Bourdage, how is it that one day you're fighting against Monsieur Papineau and the next day you're back again in his wake? Don't deny it. Suddenly you return to your wild schemes. You go much further than he does. He hates violence because deep in his heart, he's afraid. Papineau? Madame. Monsieur Lafontaine. Monsieur Rodier. Are the electors of Quebec ready for the battle? At least they know that their friends from Montreal like to fight. No ball, no session, no opening, no closing. <laughs> what a winter. <laughs> Papineau has married a lady from Quebec. He ought to know. After all, perhaps Julie Broom is rather bored, if not royal. Is she stopping the session? The women of our country have so much influence. Ah, the mistakes that a certain deputy from Montreal would make if it weren't for his Francoise. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm not influenced by my Francoise. Oh, quite a pity. Everybody knows what a model of virtue you are. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down. After you, Madame Elzea. Pardon? If Madame Bedard would care to be seated. <laughs> you weren't re-elected, Elzea. <laughs> <laughs> The son of Pierre Stanislas Bedard, only a deputy like ourselves, that's nothing much. You still have the chance of being nominated a judge. Old Kerr is dying. <laughs> well, have you reached the end of your tether, Rodier? Oh, you know me, so long as there's any rope left, eh? <laughs> so you believe that the women of Quebec, with their vanity, will only really be satisfied if there's no session? I wonder if the electorate of Montreal, with their mudslinging, actors, all of them, led by Papineau and Rodier, could go without the session. Papineau and Rodier. Certainly those who make the most noise have the illusion of power. It's really the silent who lead. My respects, monsieur. Do you think Papineau is play-acting? He takes himself seriously. If he's acting, it's a tragedy. Parliament is a stage on which he plays his role to attract the eyes of all upper and lower Canada. Do you know him, madame? You don't even have the slightest doubts about him? I think he's sincere. Could you tell me just exactly what he's after? Independence. For his people, I suppose. But from whom? Those who oppress them. The church? I don't think he includes the church among his oppressors. Is it the parish law? Even parishioners have the right to consider things temporal. Papineau was quite right there. I even supported him. Yes, and so did I. You don't surprise me. And La Fontaine supported him too. The people of Montreal would follow Papineau anywhere. Politeness for politeness. Indeed, under Bedard, your father-in-law, madame, the people of Montreal accept the directives of a Quebecer. I remember Bedard held the reins in his hand, but even then, Papineau had his word to say and made his weight felt. Montreal and Quebec in the same stable would be pandemonium. That's right, Elzea, let's face it. A situation that could easily become critical. Which is abominably so. You who are always so positive, Monsieur Lafontaine, so lucid. Hippolyte, be careful. Oh, but where would they lead to? these uncompromising and radical attitudes. Papino declares, we aren't going to sit. Etienne Parent's newspaper, which my father-in-law founded, will no longer be able to go to print. He will be ruined, finished. <laughs> and that will only be the start. Business will perish. It will be a reign of torpor and lethargy. 
Some people are impatient. Let's try and find a solution. We must negotiate. The session will not take place. Louis Joseph Papineau Dixit. Business is in a bad way. Papineau considers that determined refusal to sit is the right method. Monsieur Lafontaine. I believe it, madame. Lord Aylmer must fix the date for the session without a minute's delay. So what will you do? Me? That day I'm not going to budge from my room. Neither will I. Neither will I. There they are. Will you sit, Beda, or will you not sit? I don't know yet. Unless we're unanimous, the plan's no use. Lord Aylmer expects Monsieur Elzéar Beda at the Chateau Saint-Louis in an hour. Papineau, of course, has not replied. That is the privilege of a gentleman. The messenger is waiting. Can you possibly realize, gentlemen of Montreal... Pardon? Monsieur Bourdage is from Richelieu. I'm sorry. Can you possibly realize, gentlemen, the degree of aberration we have reached when the prospect of a meeting between my good husband and Lord Aylmer staggers you. When simple courtesy is misrepresented and taken as an act of treason. Your good husband, madame, is hurrying to the Chateau Saint-Louis at the moment with the messenger. In view of what he has to face, don't you think he's courageous? I will spare you, madame, the epithet that comes readily to mind. Your courtesy is appreciated. You obviously know how to handle people, madame. My compliments. I return the compliment, monsieur. I always knew Louis Baudage was abrupt, but I thought him polite. Let them be indignant and slam doors. But you, the oldest member. Me, madame, once I've given my word. Excuse me. But what does Monsieur Papineau want? A republic of French conception, from which the clergy is banished? Possibly. Does he want an American republic in which Catholicism has no rights? Of course not. Does he practice his religion? No. Not as far as I know. He's a mass of contradictions, Louis-Joseph Papineau. Political head of a devoted people. Himself an unbeliever. He insists that his adversaries respect religion. He fights against theocracy. He champions the Republic. Yet he's the proprietor of a feudal-type manor. He lives on the rents from his tenants and says he's a Republican. He claims in his speeches that he doesn't want insurrection. Yet the very tone of his speeches could only lead to insurrection. Well-built, well-dressed, cultured and polite. But austere as well. Caustic. Savage. The society of Quebec displeases him. It seems that we're depraved. A resolute man? His stubbornness is only a cloak to save himself from himself. Are you serious, Madame Bedard? A dogmatist. A mere idealist. A visionary. The liberal air of freedom which flows from France and England has intoxicated Papineau. He advocates free exchange, freedom of commerce, abolition of tariff barriers. I load wheat at Lake Erie, pass through the Welland Canal, across Lake Ontario, the Lachine Canal. I continue to Quebec. I cross the ocean and then tie up in London docks. If I'm not granted a preferential tariff, how can I compete with wheat from Denmark, which is only to cross the North Sea? And suppose I ship wood. What can I do against the wood from Norway and Sweden if I build ships here? How can I compete against shipyards in England? And if the Americans decide to start building ships, and they too start to ship wood and wheat and potash, is the competition equal? Why should we be fettered? Are their ports frozen in winter five months out of twelve? 
Abolish all tariff barriers indeed. He advocates a campaign against our imported merchandise. Instead of buying cloth and thread from England, wave them yourselves at home. He has asked the Canadian deputies to appear in the house dressed in cloth they've made themselves. He's mad, inciting a population to destroy the commerce it lives by. Can't he understand that if we export, we have to import? Can our ships return with their holes empty? If we export wood, wheat and potash from our country, they have to be carried in chips. Our countrymen must wear the cloth brought back by our ships. They must eat the spices and drink the rum. That's commerce. To upset it is criminal. And you mustn't forget the capital that Irvin, Connaught and Monroe have invested. Who is going to repay the banks in London for digging the Welland Canal and the Lachine Canal? Papino? Our countrymen? Of course, we don't ask you to dissociate yourself from the people who elected you, Monsieur Beda. But you will agree with us that it's not with the odd coins that they tuck away in their stockings. They don't even know how to write. The 92 resolutions, as you know, are signed by 60,000 crosses. Not 60,000 names, 60,000 crosses. Just imagine the reaction of the Minister of Colonies in London. The Legislative Council, which the Governor appointed to protect our commerce, Papineau would have elected by crosses. He refuses to sit for this, so London will act and amend the Constitution, deny us the power of direction and give it to a pack of illiterates. Gentlemen, I beg of you, keep calm. You are intelligent. Your fellow citizens elected you Mayor of Quebec, first Mayor of Quebec, and you will be Mayor again. What position will Papineau take in a conflict between Montreal and Quebec? Monseigneur Latigue, his cousin, won his case in chambers against the Bishop of Quebec. The case in point was only a juridical dispute between ecclesiastics. The merchants of Montreal, led by Molson, have demanded the canalization of the river between Montreal and Quebec for more than two years. Will Papineau support us, I wonder? Us? Against them? In his opinion, should the port of Quebec take precedence? By refusing to sit and paralyzing commerce, will he hurt Montreal? Perhaps. However, Montreal lives from the plains around her. But he'll ruin Quebec. Last year, we exhorted our deputies to a determined refusal to sit. Unite solidly against tyranny, I said. See a little further ahead than immediate interests. We must distinguish between the calamities which are really upon us and the ghosts of calamities which our oppressors will not fail to conjure up. A faction which rejected this measure caused a division in our own ranks. We had to sit. The situation is the same, identical. Are we going to give in once again? Are we to be divided once more? The system of parliament that was given to us 40 years ago has become the instrument of despotism, an insult to the dignity of human beings, a veritable scourge. We hold the Legislative Council no better than the North Wind, which strips resolutions from the House like leaves from the trees. The last session of 1834, which we opposed, did it really mark any progress? Was there an improvement in any field? We implored the Governor to stamp out an epidemic of cholera that ravaged the land in 1832 by forbidding infested vessels to enter our ports. What was the result? Cholera ravished our country a second time. 1834 has eclipsed 1832. We were opposed to an oligarchy of merchant venturers using for their exclusive profit all that was gained from the taxes and the sufferings of our people, the resources of the country. What did we obtain? We were opposed to our workers, our peasants, deprived of teachers, bowed in ignorance, and in the guise of humility, accepting this dishonorable condition, which if left unremedied can only lead our people to the extinction of their race. What did we obtain? The 60,000 crosses that signed the 92 resolutions only brought from London mockeries, as if they came from a people only worthy of contempt. Have we any other course open to us but to abstain from a game that makes politics a mockery? 
If this abstention, even for a time, paralyzes commerce, increases our misery and our calamities, let us not forget that this is the age of audacity. Let us not forget that the bourgeois of England have obtained suppression of rotten boroughs at the expense of the landlords. Have we forgotten the principles of the French Revolution? Have we forgotten that the Americans at our very doorstep have shaken off the ignominious tutelage that we support? That they now control their own destiny? Have we forgotten the great work of liberation accomplished in Ireland by Daniel O'Connell? Have we forgotten that in Upper Canada, William Mackenzie is ready to join us against this same tyranny, this same abjection? Have we forgotten that this is the time of reforms? That we should categorically reject any reform that is not radical, that is not intended to make the Legislative Council an elected body? In other words, give back to Canadians the whip hand in administration and commerce. Give to those who made this country the means of exploiting it for their own profit. Somehow I doubt whether London will ever consent. London will agree. Under what pressure? Our own. I believe that we are overestimating our forces. We are suffering, my friends, from a melody called jealousy. We are afflicted with an illness called demagogy. He's here again, the messenger from Lord Elmer. We shall have to sit, Monsieur Papineau. And after having defied Elmer as resolutely as we have. Beda has mustered 15 votes. The English already have 15. With 30, they have a quorum. No need of us. Force us to sit. Louis Joseph Papineau. The leader had gambled and lost. French Canada, divided against itself in the constitutional arena, faced a grim alternative. For it was into rebellion that Papineau was now bitterly prepared to move.